Coming up on Digital Music Trends 159 on the 27th of November 2013, Spotify's new round, music tech funding in 2013, Turntable FM's demise, Sound Drop comes to Deezer, the Econest moves into audience segmentation and advertising, RDO sees some layoffs, Winamp shuts down, Goldie Blocks vs. the Beastie Boys, a look at the future for U2 and CMT partners with Clear Channel. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Linelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. And DMT is available as an audio and video show on a variety of channels including iTunes, most podcatchers, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, Stitcher, Spreaker, TuneIn Radio and also Audioboo from today. So to get in touch with the show you can tweet us on at DigiMusicTrends or email us on contact at DigitalMusicTrends.com. And after last week's uh, jet-lagged show I now once again uh, know what's going on and... Uh, I know what I'm talking about, so that's great, and there should be a slightly smoother experience for everybody. So I'm truly happy to welcome back today two fantastic journalists, uh, starting with Ben Cesario from the New York Times, uh, who covers a great deal of uh, the uh, uh, music industry and the digital media uh, stories uh, on the site. So I, hi, Ben, how's it going? Great, thanks for inviting me back. It's great to have you on, and uh, also it's a real pleasure to have back uh, uh, Jim Carroll, uh, an amazing music journalist uh, at the Irish Times. So hi, Jim, and great to have you on. Thanks very much, Andrea. Good to be back. And he runs the, the On The Record blog on the Irish Times website. So if you haven't read that before, it's, it's a must read and go and check that out. And so uh, this week, there's loads of ground, ground to cover. Uh, it seems like, you know, uh, things are really uh, picking up pace uh, towards the end of the year. And so uh, I want to start with uh, one of the big stories that came out this week, uh, just after actually we recorded last week's show. Uh, but that's always good because it gives us some time to di- digest the news. And that's uh, Spotify's latest fundraise. Uh, the company announced a new investment round of $250 million, well, it didn't announce, it was kind of leaked that the company got an investment around $150 million led by Technology Crossover Ventures, which puts the company's valuation at just over $4 billion. The Crossover Ventures portfolio includes the likes of Netflix, The Street, Real Networks, and Facebook, amongst others. So the firm is no stranger to online media. So guys, first up, this is an investment you'd have expected for Spotify's next round in terms of size. Ben, what's your take on this? Did I expect it? Uh, in terms of size, like, you know, do you think 250 million is something that can keep the company going for the foreseeable future and is what the company needed to, in order to expand in the way it needs to? Well, that's, uh, that's an interesting question. I, I don't know. You know, I, I don't know their burn rate and, and you know, exactly uh, what, you know, how much cash they have in the bank, et cetera. It's a lot of money. Yeah. Um, you know, and uh, I, I think that one effect of this is that this will put more pressure on them to sell or go public. Um, you know, they have they've taken in over a half a billion dollars in investment, um, and you know they've been around for five years now. Their investors are going to eventually start looking for an exit. Um, and just in the last year or two, you know, the competition in streaming services has really grown so intense, and the spread. Um, globally, um, you know, has been so rapid that, uh, you know, the, the investors are, are going to be looking for a return. And Spotify, like all of the others, has, has not earned a profit. Right. Um, so, you know, wh- whether, whether this gives them the cash they needed to take the next step, who knows, but something's got to happen. Absolutely. Jim, did you think, uh, you know, Ben made a good point. He was actually one of my follow-up questions talking about uh, VC uh, sort of expectations toward the company. Do you think that it's more likely to be an IPO scenario or an acquisition by somebody massive? Well, I think, I mean, the, the, big, the bigger thing was probably put best by Biggie Smalls many years ago, which is like more money, more problems. Because, I mean, you know, if you look at these investments coming in their way, what do the investors want? It's like Ben said. I mean, they're looking at their exit strategy and they're kind of thinking, okay, when, when can we actually get out of here? What are we going to get out of this? This basically means a lot more pressure being put on Spotify. And you look as well at the people who are making those investments. Put it that, ally that with the people who made the initial investments, the major record labels. And you suddenly got a very interesting kind of, I suppose, pot of investors looking around, kicking the tires and wanting to kind of like see where this is going it's, it, it's interesting just in view of, I suppose, of all the other stories we're covering here today you know that it, it's definitely I suppose the domination of the big players now you, you've definitely got you've got, definitely got this kind of like two track where you've got like Spotify and probably Deezer as well and everyone else and it's like I mean it's, it's, it, they're the ones making making all the action getting all the traction right now and this, this also means as well big big pressure on them to deliver results and you're asking there about like what the ultimate I suppose exit strategy will be I mean basically these investors want to make some money back and you know if it, if it does go say it does go to an IPO I mean who are, are people going to buy shares in Spotify would you buy shares in Spotify right now 
I'm not sure. I mean, I, I guess people have, have bought shares in Pandora and Pandora is, is still losing money. So there's no reason why people wouldn't buy shares in Spotify. Uh, I, I just kind of think as well, I mean, there, 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 obviously there's, there's, there's kind of issues around as well. Like, I mean, just because someone isn't making money, just because someone isn't making revenues doesn't mean that they're not, it's, it's not, it's, it's not, not a valuable company. Play, yeah. Exactly. It's not, it's not, it's not a play down the road. But in the case of like in Spotify, I mean, you know, there, those deals they've done with the majors, those deals they've kind of done to get to this particular stage, you know, like we know, we know a lot of details. We don't know the full details. I mean, it is, it is a very interesting play for the non music industry investors. Why they're getting involved. Are they seeing, are they seeing a company getting loads of good ink and like New York Times are kind of going, okay, I want, want to be part of that, or is there something else they're being attracted by? Right. And Ben, do you, do you see Spotify being seen as side by side uh, with the likes of Netflix and Pandora, for example? I do, and I think that's what they have going for them, which is that you know, to Wall Street, this is a you know, this is a digital media content play, um, and they look at the incredible success of Netflix. They look at Pandora which you know a year ago was looking a little shaky and now their price has is it doubled tripled i think right. it's tripled, tripled right over yeah. the last over the last year and they seem to have weathered uh you know the threat of iTunes radio absolutely so um you know the idea of a sort of pure play digital media company um I think it looks okay to Wall Street, and, and the, the relative success of the Twitter IPO, you know, really cannot un, be understated here. That that really set the tone of how tech stocks are going to be viewed on Wall Street right now, and it was pretty successful. Um, I don't know the price right now, but it's held pretty high, um, and there was no you know embarrassing screw up like there was with Facebook. So. Yeah. You know, if if any uh, digital music company is going to go public in the next year, uh, Spotify would seem to be the prime contender to do that. Um, the question is, though, you know, I mean, they're already valued at four billion dollars. Um, when when Pandora went public, I think they were about two billion. Um, they fluctuated. I think they're in the five to six range right now. You know, what kind of return can those investors really get? Who knows. Right, absolutely. And uh, I mean, it's interesting because Spotify is such an international company. It's got an impact in a number of different territories by now. And so in that sense, I guess it's got a broader uh, breadth of influence than Pandora ever had because Pandora has always, always been limited to a very uh, you know, narrow focus, especially on the, on the U.S. market, really. So it'd be interesting to see oh, whether... That's, a, that's an interesting question because, I mean, it's true that Pandora you know, doesn't have any reach overseas outside of, I guess, New Zealand and Australia. Um, but they, you know, I mean, they've, they've saturated the U.S. market. I mean, they're used by more than 70 million people. Um, <clears throat> and I mean, I can just tell you, you know, as an American, you know, if I go to somebody's party, there's a very good chance that they're just going to hit Pandora and that's going to be the music that they're playing. Um, so, you know, they've really, I mean, they've done incredibly well in the U.S. Um, and now it appears that they've um, taken a step back in their licensing war um, in Washington. So if there's a detente with the labels over licensing issues, they may be able to get the licenses they need in order to launch overseas. Right. And if they do that, I think they can make a pretty big splash. Absolutely. That's, that's definitely a big area of expansion for, for, for Pandora because we've seen that the month-by-month -month graphics uh, are starting to flatten in terms of growth and so they definitely need uh, new markets to bring in new revenues for the company as well. And, uh, and there was an interesting article actually this week from Karim Fanus from Music Ally who posted a great summary of music tech investment for 2013 on Tiosto. I'll add the link uh, to the show notes for the benefit of the listeners uh, and, you can, uh, and they can check that out. Uh, so the, the summary packed uh, the series investments in the music tech space at about 884 million dollars but that didn't include actually Spotify's latest round uh, as it came out only uh, this week so uh, that uh, uh, you know brings it up to over a billion dollars already for uh, 2013 and uh, you know the vast majority of the money uh, goes into uh, music services so uh, Beats Music uh, has uh, cashed in 560 million which includes the costs for the buyout of HTC's uh, share of the company uh, Spotify 250 million as I said TuneIn Radio 25 million and Songs Out 4.7 million so we're seeing here a very large player getting most of the money. Uh, there are other areas like social, for example, that have seen a, a, a smaller total amount of 53 million, but a larger number of companies being invested in. So that's nine companies. And the one thing I wanted to remark is that social recommendation and video verticals are three areas that saw the biggest uh, chunk of investment, although much smaller than the, than the media, uh, than music services. Uh, and uh, 
those are companies that don't really need any licensing agreements to operate. And even the video companies are all uh, operating off the back of YouTube. Uh, there are big MCNs. And so uh, YouTube sort of sorts out the licensing side for this, for this sort of thing. So uh, do you feel like... Uh, uh, you know, investors are avoiding in 2013 investing in companies that have big licensing costs unless they are already well on their way and well on the way to, towards scaling. I guess the exception there is Beats Music because that's uh, that's going to be a new service, right? Uh, Jim? Yes. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the figures are really interesting. I mean, the breakdown of the figures, I mean, what I, what I kind of found really interesting was one particular, I suppose, section, which was the live section. And like, right. that was only 7% of the entire investment pot, which led me to kind of think, is there, is there, a, is there some kind of like, I mean, openings here? Is there something that people are missing out on? You know, when you look at, when you go through what else, the, what, the other investments, I suppose, the main grouping investments, there's no real surprises there. You know, the, 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 the money is going where you kind of expect it to go. I, I, I suppose, like, I mean, if you were, if you were kind of like an investor looking at where the, where, the money is going into the music tech space at the moment. You kind of think, okay, they're all going there. But what are the other opportunities in there in those areas? And I suppose when it comes to live, a lot of the things which have been kind of like set up there haven't really proven themselves yet. Be it live streaming, or be it like the ticket, be it like me alternative ticket things, or be it things like I mean, gig starter or detour or things like that, where like I mean, the fa where the fans can kind of I me mean, I suppose set set the, to the the touring routing. You you asked the question about like I mean, would you say licensing is putting off you know in the investors and getting involved there. Just going, kind of going back to an answer that Ben gave earlier on, that if, for say, something like Pandora, if so, if that gets if that gets sorted out, if all those kinks get sorted out, are we going to see more investment going in there? I mean, you know, investors are... <sighs> Some investors are. Some investors will take risks, and some are very risk averse. And it's like it would be interesting to kind of like see now that we know what's going on in terms of like the big money being being given to Spotify, given this breakdown, where we'd be in a year's time. You know, the the, the piece it's a very good piece, very like I mean like I mean lots and lots of detail in it. But we made some interesting predictions about where he's going to see things going in twenty fourteen. And I'd like to kind of see like would look, would like to know which of these areas will see the most growth. And I, I I kind of come back to that live thing. I mean, you know, the fact that Live Nation are are are, are are kind of a big player, for example, and are still losing money might put off some people. But like, I mean, there's definitely, I suppose, scope in a lot of those kind of new entities moving into that area for investment, for, for, for probably, like, I mean, I suppose, well thought out investments in the future. Yeah. Ben, any thoughts on this? Uh, songs are, for example, Son Investment, uh, albeit a, a fairly small one. So, you know, it's not like investors have gone off smaller companies that have to do with licensing completely. But uh, definitely, we don't see that many companies that deal with direct content anymore. Right. Um, I'm not sure about the estimate um, on on this site, T Tiasto. Um, you know, the the biggest chunk of that pie is um, is for Beats, right? Um, and you know, Beats Beats got five hundred million dollars from the Carlyle Group, which is a very big blue chip, <coughs> uh, you know, investment company that you know I think the Bush family has been involved there, um, but. I, I believe that that money went to Beats Electronics, the right. headphone maker shell company. Um, and you know how they're going to divvy that money up. I'm I'm not sure. Um, I'm I'm sure a lot of it will, be, or some of it, you know, will be used for the launch of the music service. But you know they've got they've got headphones to make. I mean they've got factories to run. Yeah. So I'm not sure how much of that 500 million dollars is really going into music tech the where the way we're talking about it. So I think if you scale that back. This starts to look a, a, a little less crazy. Yeah. Um, um, I'm sure. What was the other question about was that, licensing? You know, about licensing. Do you, you know, you think we're going to see more companies uh, uh, come into play that are uh, doing licensing deals with the labels? Uh, is, is this, you know, uh, getting easier? Is it getting harder? And do you think investors are scared of investing in companies that have to make licensing deals in order to survive? I think it's going to keep going. I, you know, I think it's amazing that there have been so many launches uh, of of music services that do depend on licensing. Yeah. Um, you know, it it does it does scare investors a little bit, but you know, follow the money. I mean, they're they're throwing it on, they're throwing it down there. So um, I think it's going to keep going, and and I think that the you know the relative success of uh, of a spotify or deezer or pandora here is is really going to lead people i mean like they're going to want to be the next spotify they're going to be the they're going to want to be the next pandora
Absolutely. And talking about a company with high licensing costs, actually, this week Turntable.fm announced that it will shut down its service in early December as it was proving impossible to monetize a service in a way that could uh, uh, at some point offset uh, the costs of licensing involved. Uh, the company remarked on serving 400 million tracks uh, to its users over the, uh, the life of the service and uh, uh, users also created over a million listening rooms uh, on the service. Uh, Turntable was one of the hottest music properties in 2011, uh, startups in 2011, uh, but running to serious licensing issues which prompted it to shut down its uh, international access so it was only available in North America and that kind of led to a sharp drop of a user uh, in the user base which never really quite recovered uh, on that front so the company is now focusing its efforts on its uh, turntable live uh, new venture which uh, possibly is going to use up uh, the remainder of the seven million dollars uh, in venture capital that it raised from Union Square Ventures uh, at the peak of its popularity so uh, I wanted to ask you uh, you know Ben do you think that turntable could have done uh, things differently uh, you know did it uh, stumble when it was supposed to soar in, in terms of uh, uh, getting its marketing machine in play and, and getting things uh, uh, ready together with its uh, round of finance or was this just like a huge bubble that just burst really quickly like uh, a Facebook game for example I think the latter I, I think that the, you know, the, the story of Turntable um, it isn't only about the licensing problem that they, that they had. Um, I, I think it's also about the service itself and about the media coverage of it because it was, um, it was celebrated right off the bat to an enormous extent by, you know, by the, the, the media within the media bubble. Um, and their numbers were pretty good, but they never, you know, they never reached a mass market level. So it's not that I, I, I don't believe you know it's that um, the labels killed something that you know was on its way to the stars. I think it never quite reached there. Um, if they hadn't had this problem with the labels, who knows what they would have done? I mean, maybe they would have been able to throw a couple million dollars in marketing, um, but you know. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? And, and Jamie, you were talking about a live earlier, and and do you feel like uh, uh, this kind of play where they're trying to recreate the live experience online as sort of like a, a turntable listening room, but in a live context? Do you think people are gonna uh, cotton onto that and uh, pay to join a virtual crowd of people where they can that they can interact with and and do cool stuff with? It, it, it like my head says no, and my heart actually says no as well. I I I, I just can't see it. It's going going back to like I mean Ben like I mean Ben's summation over there. It just did not catch on. It didn't catch on beyond a small bubble of people. And this is kind of like I suppose a, 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 something we see repeated again and again and again with many music tech plays. You know that they just don't catch on, and they need they need to basically like I mean get a bigger audience really really fast. It could be a case of going back again to our friends the investors who want to see returns early. They want to see user numbers. I mean, the amount of kind of like startups I've seen that the minute they get, the minute they, the investors come in, the it's just unreal, real, unreal expectations, sleepless nights, pressure that the the that, that the people behind the, the actual product behind the actual service can't actually can't actually kind of cope with. In the case of Turnable FM, you like you you said 2011. I was kind of going, geez, was that long ago? Like, I mean, that's, right. two and a half, that's two and a half years ago. I mean, that's like a that's like dinosaur age in in, in, in the way that we think talk about things right now. But there's many things that we're 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 going to get very excited about in the next six months, which will be the next turntable but the, the turntable fm because they won't be able to catch on they will not be able to catch on and just those unreal expectations and yeah they're, what they're doing right now with, with lazy iteration they're trying to they're trying to be kind of like i suppose take their social play and put it put it into another another context will that work is there is there a demand for that or is it more to go, go with what you said earlier on which i was quite surprised by is it like I me mean, you, you kind of said that it's still got seven million dollars of venture capital left over in the pot well no that, that's not a left over so that was initial investment of oh, uh, yes, so, so i would imagine they have maybe some money left over that they can keep running the company with so basically what they're, what they're doing then is just like me wait until that runs out then what happens you know i mean that it, it it's, it's sometimes it, it does there's a dose of reality needed with with especially with music plays that just just seems to be missing that people kind of go like okay we will we, we'll, we'll 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 pivot we'll try new things and like we'll, we'll keep going until the money runs out but like you know there's there's a word called sustainability and like sometimes you kind of wonder where, where does this ever come in, does this ever come into effect yeah 
absolutely. Mm. And uh, you know, it's interesting to see a uh, turntable and then talk about Soundrop, which is another company that was in the news this week, because there's actually a lot of uh, uh, you know friction points between the two companies in terms of how the service operates. Uh, you know, uh, Soundrop also offers uh, listening rooms so where the fans can go, and uh, its, uh, its popularity is soaring. It started as a, a Spotify app, uh, and then it got two rounds of investment. The last one is uh, 3.4 million this September, and uh, it announced this week that it's going to integrate into Deezer as well. So it's going to branch out from uh, just Spotify and become a Deezer, uh, you know, available on Deezer uh, for Deezer users as well, which is going to expand its user base considerably. So, uh, you know, do you feel like uh, the fact that Soundrop uh, uh, propped itself against a license, license solution like Spotify that allowed it to forego any of the licensing discussions and expenses and to concentrate on the technology and delivering a great social experience. Is that what, what is making that company work, at least uh, for, for now, Ben? Um, clearly, yes. You know, I mean, they, they I think you, you, you said it. Um, they let somebody else do the licensing and they piggybacked on it and... Um, you know what they do is not exactly the same as turntable um and it's not it's not really gamified i think right but it's the same you know i mean some a basic idea um and i think that's you know that 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 that's that's a i mean that that's a lesson that lots of people have learned before that you know if you if you let somebody else do the licensing and then just come along for the party if they're successful you'll be successful um if you try to negotiate with the labels yourself um, to gamble. Absolutely. And I, Jim, I was actually talking with a few people uh, this week about, you know, the scope of licensing deals when it comes to streaming services. You know, they have a very specific set of rules that they have to comply to in terms of the way they serve their music. And I think there's a lot of companies that are hoping to push those boundaries in order to be able to do more with the music that is available through APIs of companies mm -hmm. like Spotify and Deezer and, and the like. Do you think, you know, we're going to see more types of usage, for example, oh, uh gaming? Uh, Oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, like it, 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 it's kind of like it, it's very, very straightforward. I mean, if, if the licensing is already done, if the, the heavy lifting is already done, if those things are in place, well, then it's obviously more, it's, it's easier for any new services to kind of piggyback on that and piggyback on that and try that out. And as we saw from the, from the, like, I mean, from the earlier piece we're talking about in terms of investment in this space, you know, the, the money is there to try these things out. But again, it comes down to, you know, it's almost like Me Too plays, you know, like is, is what's going to stick? What, what, what actually is the consumer looking for is the consumer quite happy with spotify or if you want to be kind of like edgy and alternative go with deezer you know especially in the states i mean or, or, or like pandora i mean it's like there, there seems it just seems to be like a number of big, a big plays and like they're the ones which are getting all the all the all the kind of like the audience right now all the user, users right now and like i mean the bulk of the, the bulk of the investment as well so yeah the, but there will always be innovators there will always be people who will be trying things out and like i mean trying like, like trying things out especially when the licensings are already done to see where that can lead and we We'll, we will see a lot of that. that that's not going to change. It was the same way 10 years ago, it the same way 10 years from now. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, looking at a company that is pushing boundaries, uh, there was news coming from Boston this week as the Econest, which is a music intelligence company that is behind uh, the recommendation features on countless apps and uh, new startups uh, services, unveiled a new tool to improve advertising segmentation on music services. So advertising is becoming a key part of the revenue streams. You know, we've seen uh, Pandora doing really well and you know, they managed to convert 58% of their advertising revenue uh, coming from mobile, which is a pretty great achievement. You know, the, the new feature of the Equinus is called Music Audience Understanding and the company believes that it can deliver a much better audience segmentation than the one currently offered by terrestrial radio stations. So terrestrial radio stations are responsible mm -hmm. for uh, over, uh, what did they say, was it 14 billion? Uh, like $15 like billion dollars, uh, per year on radio advertising for terrestrial radio. And I guess the Equinus is hoping that if they can deliver that amazing uh, you know, segmentation of the audience uh, uh, for online radio, then some of that spend is going to uh, divert into, into online, which would be pretty awesome for the companies that are working in this vertical. So you know, do you feel like uh, uh, online uh, music advertising is underserved as a field? I mean, I still find the adverts that have been served pretty crappy all around. And, and, and do you feel there is a... a big space to grow the targeting of uh, those adverts uh, like it happens on Facebook and, and it happens on YouTube, Jim? 
Yeah, the, 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 I suppose before we go into that, I mean, Econest is a very interesting company. I mean, right. they're, a company, they're a company who've been going since 2006. You know, they've, they've tried, they've, they've been involved in various kind of bits and pieces. Or initially, the, the software was, was, was saying it could accurately predict if a song would be a top 10 shoe in or a number 102 also around. I mean, it, that was back in 2006. You know, and it's kind of, it's kind of moved on. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's an example, of, I suppose, of a company that likes of sound, likes of, of, of kind of like front table, front table. FM and sound drop and all that. I mean, it's it's something that they would they, they would kind of could seek to emulate because they've they've at every single stage they've moved into something new. They've kind of like used their software, they've used their smarts to do, to kind of like you keep going there. We like you know we you talk there about someone being a story from 2011. Well, Econess has been going since 2006, and they've obviously seen this particular area of serving online ads as something that they can kind of move into, especially with the work they've done so far. And like I think it's 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 maybe kind of like important to I suppose extrapolate the longer story from something like this and how a company like that actually can it can emerge and can kind of ch can can change as things go as things go on i think that's a very interesting kind of play in terms of the equinet story yeah and it's a, it's a story of a, of, of a technology company that has managed to find users for its technology in the real world which is interesting uh, rather than developing a technology for a product it's developing a technology for technology's sake i guess at the beginning which was you know due to a bunch of graduates from mit that were amazing at doing what they did and then they managed to find ways to create a business around that technology so that's that's uh, that's pretty cool. Uh, uh, ben, what's your take on the Aconest? Do you feel like uh, uh, this is the company that could deliver a, a service like this? Well, I mean, we've heard this song before. Yeah. Um, you know, this is Pandora. Um, Pandora's promise was to advertisers um, <clears throat> that you know we're going to be able to give you um, you know all of the male hard rock fans between 25 and 34 in the greater Chicago area in these six zip codes, whatever. Um, and, you know, they, they sell a lot of advertising. Um, when they first went public, there was a, a lot of concern, a lot of consternation about how good that advertising was. And, you know, are people going to accept it? Is it annoying? Are they going to ignore those ads? How well do they target? I think the jury's still out on all of this stuff. Um, I, I think that even, you know, even, even Google and Facebook, there's just still enormous questions about how effective and, and how well targeted the ads really are. Um, so, on the one hand, that means that the whole question is a little up in the air. On the other, it does mean that there's room for somebody to really nail it. And, you know, if they're able to do it, you know, more power to them. But they, they, they have a very difficult task in front of them, I would say. Yeah. I mean, I, what I like about the idea is the fact that that's a company that has no allegiance to any, anybody in particular. So that means that if they do create a technology that can crack this space, then it's a technology that can be used across the board by a variety of different players instead of being something that, that is developed by a Pandora, for example, and then is used you know, as a proprietary technology by Pandora for the rest of its, uh, of its uh, uh, shelf life, essentially. So that, that, that's one thing that excites me about that potential. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and yeah, so, uh, you know, the Aconest is pretty cool. Uh, if you don't know about the company, go and check it out. Uh, it's, uh, I should have an interview with the uh, founder, uh, with the CEO, uh, pretty soon on the show, uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and so look out for that. And uh, um, one uh, sort of a negative story of the week uh, was the fact that there was uh, some bad news for RDO, uh, which is sort of the dark side of streaming, is the fact that, you know, the burn rate is pretty high, especially when you start mounting on staff. And uh, uh, RDO, uh, you know, was reported last week uh, to be laying off uh, somewhere in the region of a third of its workforce. I must say the numbers uh, were from TechCrunch. Uh, they've not been confirmed by the company. Uh, the company only said that it wants to improve its cost structure and ensure a scalable business model for the long term. Uh, you know, they also highlighted the fact that they tripled the new users uh, since the end of 2012. So that's a good news. And uh, RDO is also awaiting a new CEO as uh, Drew Larner announced the stepping down earlier this year. So we're waiting for that announcement and also you know they've had a fairly good 2013 I mean uh, anecdotally as a person within sort of the music tech uh, field I feel like a lot of companies a lot of people are moving to audio they're using audio they're very happy about it they're you know singing his praises uh, but whether that's you know translating into adoption on, on a broader user base that's uh, of course uh, uh, a big question mark uh, so uh, Ben you know uh, do you feel like that audio can improve its cost structure by getting rid of some stuff, especially if they're getting rid of uh, people in engineering, as it was being reported. And, uh, you know, can it compete with the likes of uh, Spotify, Deezer, and Rhapsody now as well, and uh, with Napster, uh, on, on a global scale? 
That's the big question. You know, I mean, that's the question facing Beats as well and, and everybody else. It's not good if you're laying off engineering staff. Yeah. Um, but I, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't really have any insight into, you know, what their bank account looks like. And, yeah. you know, uh, so... Um, I don't think anybody does because, uh, you know, the founders of Skype, of course, have been founding the operation for, for quite a while, so... I think it would seem odd for them to throw in the towel now, though. Right. Um, you know, I mean, they've actually come pretty far, and it's, it, it's impressive that they um, have stayed in as long as they have, even when it was pretty clear a year or two ago that Spotify was taking the lead by far. Um, so, I don't know. I'm do afraid think, I just don't have anything that intelligent to say about oh, it. Oh, that's cool. Absolutely. Ben, ben, do you think, I mean, in that case, you know, they, they, it's a bit, their, their audio is like, a bit like a kind of a Las Vegas gambler just staying at the table in the hope that the cards are going to change or the hope they're going to be bought out. Because, you know, it's like, what, like the way you've just explained it there, you know, it's like they, 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 they've, they've been there. They, they know that they're losing kind of market share to someone like Spotify or whatever, but yet they stay on, you know? Or is this a case, again, whereby there, there, is, there is money and they're just prepared to keep popping it out for as long as possible? I, I think that they there is money, and I think they're probably prepared to keep spending it. Um, I think the difference is that a couple of years ago, nobody knew how big that market was. You know, nobody knew how many people in the U.S. really would pay ten dollars a month for streaming. Um, and you know, even though um, even though Rhapsody has been here for twelve years, um, you know, the market really just hadn't taken off. So it's a question of you know how much. How much market share and how big is the market? Um, now I think it's it's becoming more clear that it's growing more slowly than people wanted it to, and there's a lot of competition in there. So, um, you know, I don't know. I, I don't really. I don't see them as Las Vegas gamblers, just sort of sticking it out, hoping that they hit the jackpot. But I think at some point, maybe it will start to become clear to them that they're not winning. Yeah. You know the the big race, and it's a shame because See. they actually like. I think they spurred companies like Spotify to improve their product as well. You know, the, some of the features audio uh, offered they offered first, and they were better than the features that Spotify was uh, offering at the time. And uh, slowly but surely, we've seen some of those features trickle back into Spotify as uh, they realized that user wanted them. So it, it, that's a great thing about having multiple companies in the field that there is more competition and there's more innovation on that front. But uh, whether that's going to last, that's uh, that's the big question mark, I guess. And uh, uh, the end of an era uh, this week as well, as Winamp is shutting down on the 20th of December. Uh, so uh, the statement reads, Winamp.com and associated web services will no longer be available past December 20th, 2013. Uh, additionally, Winamp media players will no longer be available for download. Uh, thanks for supporting the Winamp community for the past 15 years. I just want to mention it for the nostalgia factor. I, I don't know anybody who is still using Winamp. Uh, if you have any uh, fond memory of Winamp, please feel free to share but otherwise like, I'm quite happy to move on to the next story. <laughs> Any comment on that one? <laughs> I, I think like everybody else I was amazed that it's still in existence and you okay. know still was being supported. That said you know I always thought it was a good product you know I just think it was it represented a very early stage of digital music and it was blown out of the water a very long time ago so you know uh, it's just amazing. And it, what's even more amazing is that there was gossip that Microsoft or somebody might buy it. I, <laughs> well, I they still have that. a, I think off the back of Winamp, there's a network of radios called Shout, Shoutcast, I think, mm -hmm. that is still operational and it still has hundreds of thousands of listeners. So I think that was what might interest Microsoft in the, in the acquisition, uh, that network of radio, which is also going to shut down and that has some sort of user base behind it. Uh, but yeah, I wonder. Yeah. You, you always get people who are still going to use services like that. Once a service or a format goes out there, people kind of latch onto it and many people just feel this familiarity as well, you know? I mean, like, they're, they're, I, I, it's funny, anecdotally, I met someone in, in Dublin last week, the week before, he had his Zoom, you know, he was still using, he was still using that. And you're <laughs> wow. laughing now, Andrea, but, like, he's quite happy with it. He's really happy with it. Same with, like, I mean, there's people who look at the cassette revival, look at, like, I mean, there's, there's, there's even a, a mini, like, a, a, a mini disc bubble beginning to emerge again. Certain formats, if there's no Nothing wrong with them. People always hatch on them. The same with some kind of services. I mean, just, there was an article you linked to when you on the notes of the show, and you were kind of said the article said that there was comments coming in every minute from users bemoaning the fact that this that that the, the, the tombstone was going up with Winamp RIP on it. There will always be people who kind of like are quite happy to kind of stick with that, you know. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I posted a nostalgia photo of my old Goodman's CD MP3 player from uh, uh, the late 90s, which was, uh, <laughs> I think, my first MP3 machine. <laughs> And uh, yeah, that was quite something. You can still find that on eBay. Actually, it's quite, it's quite, it's quite amazing. Uh, but uh, yeah, Winamp is kind of uh, it's a non it's a non story for me. But it's going to be interesting to see whether Microsoft picks it up and what happens to the brand because uh, it's still recognizable, I guess, for anybody that is sort of my Old. my age and above. <laughs> you have to be at least like. In your late twenties, to <laughs> to remember what went up is. <laughs> well, it's funny that you know at at one time the the MP3 was a new technology that you know not only just wasn't widely recognized, but it needed a player. You know, I mean it 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 was a encoding format that needed a decoder device, and Winamp was the best at the time. Absolutely. However, that was you know in the in the Clinton administration. <laughs> <laughs> and you could download all those amazing skins, you can make it all personalized. It, it, it was fun. It was fun at the time. And, uh, uh, and talking about... Uh, okay, I wanted to move on to talk about the Beastie Boys story. So this is one of the big developing stories of this week. It only came up very recently, so uh, uh, I've been trying to sort of... Uh, struggling to understand what's going on in the last uh, sort of 24 hours or so. Uh, but uh, uh, essentially what's happening is that uh, Goldie Blocks, uh, which is uh, a startup which produces toys specifically aimed at, at girls uh, because it wants to get more girls into engineering, uh, you know, has been known for promoting its products through viral videos. So, for example, they made this uh, uh, Goldie Blocks breaks into Toys R Us vi viral video, uh, which was based on Queens We Are The Champions. And, you know, they're... they're uh, you know, parodies essentially that are created to drive engagement with the products and also to promote their ideals uh, of you know getting more girls involved into technology. Uh, so the, the company created a parody of the Beastie Boys song uh, "Girls," uh, which went viral and has had over 10, 12 million hits, I think, uh, to, to this point. Uh, and then, uh, as soon as uh, the Beastie Boys and, and their label started making some noise about the fact that the song had been parodied without uh, anybody's permission, essentially they proceeded to sue the Beastie Boys. Uh, preemptively at uh, the first sign of, of, of complaint in order to prove the fair use right uh, of the song uh, as it is a parody video. So uh, that's a very interesting case because, you know, it's the first time that we, see, you know, one of the first times that we see this type of challenge done against, uh, you know, from a commercial company that is used to the parody commercially, uh, trying to prove that it, they actually have a fair use case uh, uh, in this, in, in, the, in, this in, in this scenario. And the Electronic Frontier Foundation actually released an article saying that they support the fair use case of uh, 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 Goldie Blocks, uh, which is uh, pretty interesting because it means that if if they do get the go ahead on that, then it could open a whole kind of worms essentially. So, uh, you know, in the UK, I can't access the video right now. I don't know what's happened. It looks like it's been turned private, so I'm not sure what kind of permissions have been switched off. But uh, you know, from your perspective, uh, you know, do you feel like this is a just a little blip? Uh, is this something that could change the way companies look at their promotion and, and the way they create parodies around copyrighted content and used in a commercial context as well? Uh, uh, ben? Well, to answer your question about what happened, I think you should go read Peter Kafka's column because he just wrote about this like an hour or two ago. Oh, okay, I think. great. I haven't seen Peter's um, column yet. I mean, Goldie Blocks blinked. Um, you know, they, they, they pulled the video and they, um, they removed the song. Right. Um, I don't know. I I find this whole thing really depressing, and you know, just a just a a very depressing example of the never ending war between the copyright industry and the Silicon Valley tech industry. Um, and it, it's over. It's over copyright. And um, I was not surprised at all to see the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Um, take their stand on it, um, and you know it. You have a you have a Silicon Valley company that is making a product, but is um, boasting of their noble intentions to improve society. Um, meanwhile, you know they're in business to make money, um, and then there's this really just vicious fight over this copyright issue about is it fair use. Or is it not fair use? And that's really something that none of us can answer, not only because we're not lawyers, or at least I'm not, but because in the U.S., you know, it's up to a judge to decide that. It's an affirmative defense. It's not really something that you can state and say, we're a fair use person. It's, it, you know, it's, it's a defense to use if you are sued. Um, 
it looks like um, it look it looks like Goldie Blocks blinked, you know, because they they pulled the video. Um, but I mean, to me, this just is an example of just how screwed up um, the whole system is, and how it's 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 not anywhere closer to being solved. You know, this is going to happen again and again and again. Right. Absolutely. And Jim, uh, you know, how, how do you feel about these preemptive suits? They're kind of it's it's interesting to see this happening and you know as as ben said we can't really answer to the to the case itself yeah. because it's very complex but uh, as far as you know perhaps seeing more of this uh, coming up do you think that's that's going to be the case Absolutely. I mean, you know, like, I mean, preemptive pre strikes, preemptive pre legal actions involve lawyers, and lawyers like nothing better than to, like, I me mean, have cases ongoing that they can claim commissions <laughs> from, you know? I mean, look, look, at, look, at the recent, look at the recent situation with, I, I can't remember the name of the company, but it's companies going around buying, buying catalogues of, you know, like old or poor or dead musicians, and basically, like, in going through them to find out who they can sue, be it Jay Z or Kanye West. There will always be cases like this. In this particular case, though, I mean, I thought it was quite interesting that the Beastie Boys, who were kind of like targeted, you know, that and like they, they, they the fact is like they use it they use it on the video and then BC Boys kind of came out and, and actually said I, I, I can't remember where I'm reading from I think it was maybe the Sydney Morning Herald and was, there was a, a quote from the BC Boys there saying well actually hang on a second we're not actually suing anyone here you know I mean they, 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 that's that, that's not it's not coming from us so like you know there there is there's also possibility do you buy that the Sydney Morning the, the the which the uh, well just that I mean that hey you know. We didn't do anything here. I mean, like, I, it's true that there was no lawsuit filed in court, but I think it's very, I think it's very believable that some lawyers made a phone call and said, "Watch out," you know, yeah. What, yeah, because yeah, yeah, that's yeah. just, I mean, that's what that's what lawyers do. And that's a, a universal release, right? That track, I believe. Well, it is now, I guess. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, the Capital Telephone, or could be, could be Warner's. I can't remember which way, which way it works. No, you're right. I mean, like, you know, there's no smoke without fire. And, that, and there was obviously a, a phone call made to someone kind of saying, like, watch your step boy or girl. You know, you, you don't know who you're dealing with here, you know. And, they, and then what, what, what they did was what, they should, what every kind of company trying to flog, flog a story or flog a power is going to do, they're going to, like, meme release a press release about it, get onto their favorite journalists about it, make sure the story gets lots and lots of attention and gets lots and lots of traction, you know. Absolutely. It's interesting. But the thing I mean, is that this doesn't really shed any light on fair use, I don't think. I mean, because <laughs> it's, it's, you know, this is going to be settled by press release. It's going to be settled, you know, with a blog post. It's not going to go to the Supreme Court. There's not going to be any clarity on what fair use is. At least that's my prediction. We'll see. I think so. Yeah, and I, 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 I'm going to see boys in the Supreme Court. <laughs> That'd be amazing. No, you're, you're absolutely right, Ben, because uh, I feel like the, the case. The cases where this type of lawsuit could go in the favor of the company are very limited to a subset of companies like this one that have a very open mission statement as to what they want to do, which is beyond just being a commercial company. And that kind of plays into some of the factors that are that are being considered for the fair use case. It plays in their favor and it can probably uh, favor a result in court as well. Uh, but if Microsoft was to do the same thing, even if it was a parody, of a commercial song because it is Microsoft and it's a massive company, then it would still probably be liable to pay some sort of a copyright to the to the uh, to the original songwriter. It's it's kind of it's kind of a mess. Unfortunately, well, I think this just shows also just how entrenched these two sides are, and you know the the language just does not change about a um, we have a Silicon Valley company that uses the word disrupt in their marketing over and over again. Um, they claim that they're um, performing this great benefit to society by inspiring our uh, girls, um, but you know, I mean, there's they're, they're they're a company that's out to make money. I mean, that's that is that is their purpose. Um, who believe that um, our mission, you know, our our mission of improving society through our product allows us to take your song and do what we want with it. And on the other side, you have. Um, you know, you have a uh, an artist, and and you know the music copyright side, which says this is my property, and you may not touch it without my permission. And there's just you know, it's just a clash. Like there is no, there's there's no way for this to be resolved except for people to back down. Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, finally, uh, I just wanted to mention, I guess, because uh, it's uh, a UK company, and uh, I'm here in London, so I, sh I really should. It's one of the biggest. Um, 
UK music, digital music companies around. So Seven Digital has revealed uh, being in a reverse takeover talks with the radio focus company UBC Media. UBC Media produces uh, radio shows for a number of stations, but through its uh, unique interactive arm, it also has a strong uh, technology background, which kind of meshes well with uh, Seven Digital's uh, uh, also a technology heavy uh, infrastructure. So uh, the talks are backed by a letter of intent uh, where Seven Digital agrees to buy UBC. UBC in turn is providing a convertible loan to Seven Digital of around a million. I can't even begin to pretend that I understand what a uh, reverse takeover is and how it works, to be honest. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, the fact that UBC is a publicly listed company means that if the merger was to take place, then Seven Digital will also become a publicly publicly traded company, which is a big change uh, for Seven Digital. And uh, you know, it could be an interesting thing because you know, of course, uh, it merges two companies that are doing two things audio related but UBC is more a spoken words focused and of course 7 Digital is more music focused so uh, I don't know if you guys have any uh, anything to add to that story as far as uh, comments uh, uh, anybody? No? I don't know much about it so No, no exactly I, yeah, yeah. I, 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 it took me a while I, just to get around the notion of re reverse takeover and what it <laughs> entails so. I, think that's, I think that's David taking over Goliath <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and so uh, I wanted to finish, uh, Jim, by asking you about a story you posted. Uh, 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 actually, I've got a story for each for each of you guys. Um, uh, uh, a story about you too, and what's going to happen with the, the new album? What's 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 the latest? Uh, the rumbles and grumbles uh, from doubling on the latest U2 release. Uh, do you have any any news on that front from your from your article? I, I would say it's less news and more just kind of like informed opinion. I mean, right. Ben's the first person who started all this two weeks ago with the story in New York Times about Live Nation by principal management and Maverick and Maverick uh, Guy Series company. And what's interesting is when you dig into it, like what exactly are Live Nation buying here? Principal management have one client, U2, who are already kind of like tied up with Live Nation via the deal they did back in 2008. Yeah, principal management's other, other big client, Peter Harvey, left the company over the summer and is now managed by Brian Message at ATC. So it's like, so what exactly is going on here? You know, and there's also, it's, it's kind of like, there's been no statement from you 2 There's been nothing from you 2 There hasn't even been a, a pat on the back for Paul McGuinness, or there hasn't even been, been like, I mean, a welcome drink for Guy Seri coming on board. What exactly is right. going on there? It's unlike you 2 to do something like that. Plus, there's also the fact that Billboard revealed that Guy Seri has actually been doing deals, taking calls, ma having meetings on u behalf for, for, for a while. I mean, he's the one that they're talking about regarding the Super Bowl thing, and also, like, I mean, the early setup for the next album. So, like, you know, what, 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 what stage did that begin? I mean, I, I do know from kind of source in Dublin that Paul McGuinness was talking about 18 months ago about giving giving up the reins and he was I, I haven't got the exact quote but he was he was I suppose alluding to a Steve Jobs like succession race which made, made certain several people laugh you know that he they, 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 from, from an early stage Guy Seri had been kind of targeted as the man they wanted for the job you've also got to wonder how much management's involved with a band like U2 at this particular stage because I mean it, it, it's not more administration than anything else and also it's the band's decision to hire him because I mean, of the, of the, obviously because the whole employer employee uh, relationship I'm just fascinated by what exactly Live Nation again for the 30 million. And also, I'm fascinated by the fact that it's McGinnis who made the strike. McGinnis is the guy who gave you Ben the comments, you know, in the first place. That that and it all stems from that. There, there's been no backup from the band. And when you talk to people who are, what I also find interesting is that, like being, being based in Dublin, there's a lot of people who would claim to have, I suppose, inside knowledge of what's going on with you too, and also a kind of favoured media outlets. And those favoured media outlets and insiders have absolutely no more information than the likes of me, who's definitely outside the tent. I, I, I just find it, it, it to be a story that is, it's, it's, it's just fascinating on several levels. It's about the kind of, like, I suppose, the, the, disillusionment, the disillusion of a long-term business relationship between, between Paul McGuinness and U2, a 35-year strong one. And also, like, what exactly are Live Nation getting out of this? Yeah, definitely. And it's interesting also the challenges of a, of a band that is moving into, you know, a very new economy of music and how they make that work with a management that perhaps doesn't have their head screwed on in that particular direction and how that works out for them i guess jim jim can i ask because i i mean i i also i mean i think it's a totally fascinating story um and you know i i think just to answer some of your questions i, I think that what live nation is getting um is you know a share of youtube management commissions i mean i think this yeah. is essentially live nation buying U2 management, but I think you're exactly right that at this point in history, they don't need management in quite the way that they did in 1981. Um, and I, I, I doubt that Guy Osiri will, will have the same role um, now, and also probably the same 
I mean, don't quote me, but I'm, I'm guessing not the same commission structure that Paul had, which I think was equal, right? Didn't, didn't they, didn't he get 20%? Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, which is just a phenomenal amount of money when you're talking about you two. Mm. Um, but w- what is the reaction in, in Ireland? I mean, is it, is it, per- is, is everyone as perplexed about this? No, 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 no. You see, they, they, there's not the same level, I suppose, of kind of like like, like for a forensic insight that we're talking about here about it. I mean, most people just look about it. Wow, look, he's going after 35 years. Goodbye to, the, goodbye to the master, you know, goodbye to like the person who guided them all the way along. And what I kind of find quite interesting is that new, a lot of news desks have had have been finding it quite difficult to find a recent photograph of you two, i.e. from the last 10 years, with the manager. And like, wow. a, like, like a, I, I just kind of thought that was a very interesting nugget from my photo desk about this, you know? And like, there is, it's 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 surprise, you know, and no one's digging that deeply because it's like you know it, there, there isn't really a, a much of a music media, a, a music business media kind of network here. But I, a, anyone who kind of does follow it is digging and kind of going like, what exactly is going on here? What you said about the commissions is quite true, but do we? The, the one thing we don't need, don't know is has there been a deal do, like, in terms of what the terms of the contract are between McGinnis, McGinnis and Principal Manager and you two? Was there was that for five years? Was it for ten years? Is that up? You know, so like I can I can see why right. like she will go in there in terms of commissions. But the actual terms of the deal are, are quite interesting. I mean, McGinnis did, like, you know, he, has, he did signal about 18 months ago to people that he was retiring. So I'm looking upon this almost like a, the Live Nation deal in some ways is a golden carriage clock. You know, it's like, I mean, here you are, Paul. Thanks very much for all your, your, your help. Here's 30 million. Go to your nice house in Wicklow. Buy some more horses. Buy some more nice paintings. Have a really good life, you know. And it will be interesting as well, just to bring it back to why we're talking here about, like, the digital music side. The Will McGinnis, what, what will he do right now? I mean, like, you know, he's a relatively young man. He is very, very well connected. I mean, he does. He does. He doesn't. He he knows all the right people. He, know, he and he's a very kind of like sociable, clubable kind of guy. Will he start ma- like making investments as well? Here in Ireland, he's invested in a radio station, and a TV station, and a film studio called Ar- Ar- Ardmore Studios. So I mean, maybe it's a case of will he start ma- make, looking for some global investments to make? Right. That's pretty fascinating. Or a new artist to break? Right. No. <laughs> <laughs> he has not a great track record in that, in, in that regard, uh, as, 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 as like Paddy Casey and whatever can kind of can testify. He was very much a, a, a one artist man. That was you too. He did his best with PJ Harvey, the Pretenders, and the Rapture, but they never broke on the same scale. I mean, a band like you too, I think, is just like, is a once in a lifetime occurrence, you know. And he struck very lucky. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Ben, I wanted to finish uh, with you uh, asking about uh, a post you uh, made it, uh, uh, yesterday, I think, uh, or today, uh, about a clear channel pairing with a CMT, so uh, the country music uh, uh, television and uh, how that affects uh, sort of the balance of country music in the US, which I know very, very little about. Well, country music is big here, you know. I mean, it's had it's had its waves of popularity over the years, and right now it's on a big up wave, um, thanks basically to Taylor Swift and you know um, Carrie Underwood and a lot of like younger stars that have that really lean toward pop. So country music sales are strong. Country is is big on the radio here. New York City has its first country music station. Uh, in 17 years, wow! It was it was started earlier this year, and this has been one of these these. I mean, the, I don't expect you guys to know about this, but the the whole New York City radio market is bizarre. It's really weird. There's no current rock station in New York, and until recently, there was no country station, um, which seems maybe a little more reasonable, um, but. Mm. Basically, the you know uh, Clear Channel is is the giant. It has over eight hundred radio stations throughout the country, um, and it has a very fast rising competitor in a company called Cumulus, um, which I think owns about four hundred stations. Um, and it was created um, out of a merger a couple of years ago. It's grown very very fast, and they've targeted country. Um, as one area that they want to dominate. So all of a sudden there's a radio war over country music. Um, and CMT is a cable television uh, channel that's owned by Viacom, and it's kind of, a, it's kind of like the country version of MTV. Right. Um, and I think it's going to be very interesting to see what happens there. I mean, I, I think this would probably um, not be seen by you guys on a daily basis. Um, but... I mean, they both basically, you know, the symbol here is Taylor Swift, and I mean, it's like every everybody wants a piece of her, and you know, her star just keeps rising, and um, 
you know, what she represents as success to all kinds of different sides of the media business here. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, it's fascinating. Uh, I mean, I know very little about CMT. I think the, the only things I know were from uh, Jay Frank, who was one of the executives there, and, uh, and now he's also uh, has a label and, and uh, mm. publishes uh, books on, on, on music. So, uh, yeah, it's fascinating to, uh, to see what's happening there. And, and Cumulus has had a few stories as well that we talked about on DMT, different mergers and partnerships that they've been trying to do uh, in the last They few have months. an investment in RDO. Exactly. Mm. So, uh, yeah. Uh, fascinating stuff and uh, well that, that uh, concludes uh, today's show i think uh, guys anything that you want to plug or uh, whether it's your own site or your publication site ben um hey you know check out the new york times <laughs> 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 yeah. buy a digital subscription keep the lights on Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And uh, and also you can search for Ben's pieces uh, 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 on the New York Times. If you just search for his name, even on Google, you can find the whole list of his articles, and you can subscribe to his feeds as well, which is uh, which is great a great way to keep up with uh, what you're doing. Same goes for Jim. Uh, Jim, it's uh, is, is there an easy URL to get to your on the record blog? Thankfully, there is now irishtimes.com forward slash otr on the record. Oh, perfect. Ah. Awesome. Because uh, yeah. Finally, finally, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So I'll post that in the show notes and, and I'll make sure you up, up, I'll post your uh, Twitter accounts as well. Uh, well, thanks so much, uh, guys, for joining me today. It was a real pleasure. And uh, thanks so much for listening to the show. Uh, again, uh, you can contact uh, contact the show with any feedback on contact at digitalmusictrans.com or uh, tweet us on at digimusictrans. You can also check out the one-to-one show, which also comes out weekly, which has interviews with interesting uh, new music startups and digital media companies. Uh, thanks so much for listening. Have a great week. And until next time. And that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.